right, good morning and welcome everybody. Welcome to the Standing Committee on Economic Development and Environment. Today this is our uh, public technical briefing on caribou range plans with the Department of Environment and Natural Resources. And I'm um, not sure who we, uh, if we have some opening comments, but uh, well, before we get started, in fact, I'm going to uh, ask members to introduce themselves and I'll start over on my far left. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome, uh, Herb Nakamak from the Nuck Welcome, everybody. Shane Thompson, the Hindi. Good morning, Danny McNeely, Santu Region. Kevin O'Reilly, Frame Lake. And I'm Corey Vanthine, MLA for Yellowknife North, and we have also with us from our research department, uh, Kathleen Knuch, and we also have from uh, the clerk's office, Mr. Michael Ball, and also intending sitting in with us from uh, research is Mr. Lee Selleck. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Deputy Minister Dragon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, today we'll be presenting technical briefings on two caribou range planning initiatives that are underway within the Northwest Territories. With me, uh, I have Dr. Brett Elkin, who's our Director of Wildlife, as well as uh, Dr. James Hodgson, who's our uh, Wildlife Biologist under Environmental Assessment and Habitat, as well as our Wildlife Biologist, Andrea Patnode, who's uh, under cumulative effects in the wildlife division. Um, the first briefing will be on boreal caribou range planning framework. Range plans are required under the National Recovery Strategy for boreal caribou in order to demonstrate how critical habitat for the species will be maintained and protected. The GNWT is working collaboratively with its co-management partners to develop a made-in-the-north approach to managing boreal cab caribou habitat in the NWT. The first step in this process is the development of a boreal caribou range planning framework which will establish the broad approach to developing regional plans for boreal caribou across the NWT. I figure what we could do is we'll do that presentation first on boreal caribou, go into uh, Q's and A's if, uh, if that's agreeable with the chair, and then we'll switch to the second briefing which will be uh, a Bathurst caribou range plan. And the reason I thought we would do that is sometimes they get confused in terms of the two. And so uh, if, if you're agreeable, we will do that. The second briefing, uh, this plan on the Bathurst Caribou Range Plan is intended to manage cumulative effects across the range of the Bathurst Caribou Herd and support the conservation and recovery of this herd. The GNWT initiated the Bathurst Range Planning process in 2014 in response to concerns about the cumulative effects of human activities on the Bathurst Caribou Herd Range. This process has been, has been led by a working group comprised of 21 organizations including Indigenous governments, federal and territorial departments, NGOs and industry. So today I have Dr. Brett Elkin who will be giving both presentations um, and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you, okay. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Dragon. And just a couple of reminders for folks that um, you don't have to touch your microphones. Our audio-visual technician can exchange the, um, or will turn the mics off and on uh, as the conversation exchanges through the chair. Okay, and without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, uh, Dr. Elkin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you, in your package, you have the presentation uh, starting on the introductory slide. Um, I'd like to provide you an update first on the boreal caribou range planning process that we're using in the Northwest Territories. In this presentation, I will provide some background information on our legal requirement to protect boreal caribou under both the Federal and Territorial Species at Risk Acts, and current efforts to develop regional boreal caribou range plans that will support, support both critical habitat protection and economic development. To turn to slide two, uh, we have an outline of what the presentation will include. Uh, this morning we will cover an update on the status of boreal caribou in the NWT and our legal requirements for protecting their habitat. We'll cover our approach to boreal caribou range planning across the NWT, the boreal caribou range planning framework and the key elements that it will include, the process used for consultation and engagement on the framework, and finally next steps in the process. On slide three, we have a status on the NWT status of boreal caribou. There are an estimated six to 7,000 boreal caribou across the Northwest Territories, and our, the population is currently considered to be self-sustaining. 
In 2003, boreal caribou were listed as threatened under the Federal Species at Risk Act. Boreal caribou were also listed as threatened in the NWT in 2014 by the Conference of Management Authorities under the NWT Species at Risk Act. Uh, the Ind Conference of Management Authorities, as you may remember, is made up of wildlife co-management boards and governments that have responsibility for wildlife management in the NWT under legislation or land claim agreements. Mm -hmm. These include the Wildlife Management Advisory Council, NWT, the Gwich'in Renewable Resources Board, the Sawtu Renewable Resources Board, the Wakizi Renewable Resources Board, the Clicho Government, the Government of the Northwest Territories, and the Government of Canada. It is important to note that under the NWT Species at Risk Act, the listing of boreal caribou did not result in any automatic prohibitions or restrictions on harvesting or habitat. Any decisions on actions uh, are made collaboratively by the management authorities. Currently, there are no restrictions on indigenous harvest of boreal caribou in, in the NWT. If you turn to slide four. <coughs> Habitat disturbance and the resulting increased predation is considered to be a major factor in boreal caribou population declines across Canada. Under the Federal Species at Risk Act, there's a legal requirement to protect critical habitat. For boreal caribou, critical habitat has been defined as at least 65% undisturbed habitat within each local boreal caribou population range across Canada. And for the definition of habitat disturbance, it includes both human development and fire. The National Boreal Caribou Recovery Strategy uh, in 2012 recommended jurisdictions develop range plans to identify how they will protect critical habitat. Environment and Climate Change Canada have been negotiating boreal caribou conservation agreements under Section 11 of the Federal Species at Risk Act with all jurisdictions that have boreal caribou. ENR has been negotiating a Section 11 agreement that outlines how the GNWT and our co-management partners will develop range plans for boreal caribou across the, their range in the Northwest Territories. In the NWT recovery strategy, one of the key objectives is also to ensure ha adequate habitat across the NWT range to maintain a healthy and sustainable population of boreal caribou. The GNWT has formally committed to the completion of boreal caribou range plans for the NWT and is currently working with its co-management partners to develop them. Slide 5. In the NWT, <coughs> boreal caribou are found in a large contiguous range that is called NT1, Northwest Territories <coughs> 1. The NT1 range covers about one-third of the land of the NWT and has 69% undisturbed habitat currently. Fire is the main source of disturbance on the NT1 range, currently at about 23%. Human, human disturbance accounts for 9.1% currently across the range, some of which overlaps with uh, the areas that are currently burned. It's important to note that the human disturbance is higher in the southern part of our range, where we see disturbance at 16.1%. Our approach to developing boreal caribou range plans includes the development of five regional range, pl range plans, <coughs> one each in the Inuvialuit, Gwich'in, Sawtu, and Wakiji areas, as well as one in the Southern Northwest Territories. Our range plans will respect land claim agreements, will utilize regional land use planning processes, management boards, and existing policies and legislation, and will take a coordinated approach to have the five regional plans work together to meet the overall 65% undisturbed habitat target for the NWT. It's our intent to have this process build on the NWT's existing integrated resource management system and rely on regionally based decision making. We believe this balanced approach will promote caribou conservation, ensure compliance with the Species at Risk Act requirements, maximize opportunities and flexibility for development, and support regional equity. Slide 6 provides an overview of a boreal caribou range planning framework. We are in the process of finalizing a boreal caribou range planning framework, which will guide how we will develop range plans going forward for boreal caribou in the NWT. This framework spells out what factors range plans need to consider, how we will manage disturbance, what actions can be taken depending on how much disturbance is in an area, and how we will implement these actions. Slide 6 shows the key elements in the range planning framework. 
The ENR released the framework, a framework discussion document in May 2018, which outlined a broad approach to developing Made in the North range plans for the NWT. This approach includes the following key elements. We will use regional division of the range plan to allow flexibility, equity, and recognition of established land use plans in regional land and water boards. Regional disturbance thresholds that account for regional differences in fire disturbance while leaving room in each region for development. A tiered management framework that allows for different levels of management, either basic, enhanced, or intensive, that take into account the level of habitat disturbance, which we will categorize as low risk, cautionary, or high risk, relative importance of different areas to boreal caribou, existing land protection, and development interests. This tiered management framework is intended to provide a more flexible alternative to strict prohibitions against the destruction of critical habitat. The framework identifies monitoring that needs to be done as well, and the range plans will be renewed on a 10-year cycle with a five-year midterm evaluation. Slide 8 shows the consultation and engagement that is currently ongoing. The GNWD is currently conducting public engagement and consultation on the framework, which will guide future development of five regional range plans. Formal Section 35 consultation letters were sent to Indigenous governments and organizations in May 2018, and the public was given an opportunity to comment. Two regional working groups, one in the north and one in the south, were formed as a forum to review and provide input into the framework. Membership in these working groups includes representatives from Indigenous governments and organizations with land management authority, renewable resources boards, land use planning boards, regulatory and review boards, and key industry and environmental stakeholder groups such as the Chamber of Mines, Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, and the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society. These working groups have met twice so far, July and October 2018, and will meet again to review and provide input into the framework in February 2019. Public comments were also encouraged through newspaper and radio ads and via Facebook. The uh, deadline for public comment will be December 21st, 2018. Slide number nine outlines the next steps moving forward in this ongoing process, uh, covering the period from January to June 2019. Once the consultation period has closed on December 21st, uh, we will work to revise the range planning framework as needed based on input. The northern and southern working groups have a, will have another opportunity to review the document, meet and discuss any issues they have identified. The northern working group has also asked that the document be brought back to their communities at regional meetings. We have meetings planned in Yellowknife, Norman Wells and two in Inuvik, one for Gwich'in communities and one for Inuvialuit communities. The draft Boreal Caribou Range Planning Framework will then be submitted to the Wildlife Management Boards for their review as per the processes under the land claim agreements. We plan to finalize and release the framework in June 2019. After that, the work will begun, begin on the five regional range plans. We will start work on the Southern NWT and Wakiji plans first, followed by the Sawtu, Gwich'in and Inubialuit plans. That I'll turn it back uh, to the Deputy Minister with the permission of the Chair. Okay, thank you, Dr. Alkin. Turn it over to you, Dr. Dragon. Uh, thanks. Um, so just some brief comments in terms of the engagement and, and the work that we've done in, in coming towards this document. I think it's been a very positive experience with our different stakeholders. Um, and today I have uh, Dr. James Hodgson as well, and the reason I brought the two uh, biologists here as they've been working uh, specifically on the respective uh, frameworks so just wanted to make sure that you guys had the opportunity for questions and comments so uh, open it up for questions all right thank you with that I'll turn it over to committee comments questions concerns from committee who wants to start mr. McNeely thank you mr. chair as um, some of you probably know that we had a SSI Sawtooth land claim meeting with with the government, and I was invited to participate. And 
I've got to respect the contents of, uh, of the land claim agreement and the wishes of the leadership in order to implement that agreement. And one of the things that was on the agenda was boreal and barren land caribou. And the, uh, the presentation of, of uh, last summer's uh, surveyed results. So that dialogue is still continuing. And being mindful of that, I, I don't want to ignore uh, leadership's endeavors. It's, it's all of the same concern. Um, so being, being mindful of that, in short, uh, I, I see your information and I see your passion towards developing a recovery plan in consultation with the various groups. And that's all good. And you've got a meeting coming up in Norman Wells. I look forward to receiving an invitation and an agenda on that as well. So I'm, I'm going to uh, I'm going to reserve some of my questions for our, our future meetings uh, jointly uh, with uh, the Satu leadership on, on this on this boreal caribou issue. But having having knowledge of <clears throat> of the area. Um, one question I got is, when you identify the boreal herd as decreasing, or evidence of decreasing, what kind of studies has been done for you to come to that conclusion? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Dragon. So, uh, in looking at boreal caribou uh, versus uh, barren ground caribou, again, when we look at populations, right now we, we continue to look at how we not only use uh, census information, uh, but as well uh, we have callers that are deployed on, on various uh, herds. And as you know, uh, boreal caribou are a little different than the barren ground in terms of their migratory routes, and they, they stay put in, in their areas pretty to defined areas. And, I'll, I'll refer to Dr. Hodgson in terms of explaining some of the, the stuff that we're doing as well on, on studying them. But right now, what we see as a department is uh, we have a, a sustaining herd. So we know that that's in between the, the six to 7,000 range. Um, as we look at different pockets of this species, um, it's a little harder to do than the barren ground. and. Uh, we've tried to deploy not only through the census and doing aerial counts, but also looking at uh, the opportunity to look at callers and range. Uh, one of the things that I think uh, we're going to be looking at as well will be on the land. Um, and as you know, uh, what we started to do this year is uh, formed a, an on the land unit within ENR uh, with the goal of gathering more traditional knowledge on our species, and especially keystone species like caribou. So that's another way that we're going to be looking at it from not only the, uh, the science perspective, but also the traditional knowledge perspective. So I'll uh, turn it over to Dr. Hodgson, and he can explain some of the other uh, methods that we use. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Dragon. I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Hodgson. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So. Um, the evidence for declining boreal caribou populations was mainly from population monitoring that was being done in the Dacho and South Slave regions. So the populations in those areas have been studied for more than 10 years now. And when the assessment of that species was done in 2012, there was evidence of population declines uh, in those two regions. And that's also the part of the territory where boreal caribou are at their highest densities, so we thought, based on that, a large proportion of the NWT population was at risk. Um, there was also some population monitoring done in the Gwich'in and Inuvialuit regions, which showed that they were actually doing okay in those regions. And in the Satu, we didn't have any population trend information at the time the assessment was done. Thank you. Anything further, Mr. McNeely? <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, 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 that type of information, I, I guess, would have to be shared with, with the SAW 2 because the SAW 2, according to the leadership's comments, is really of the impression that the herd is in decline and, and we've got to pull up our socks here and get a recovery plan. And it's, uh, 
a sense of emergency, I would say, to the crisis of the declining, but actually you know, you're saying there, there's no surveys on, on the population itself for the Satu region. And the Satu region, as you know, uh, makes up a large portion of the uh, map covering the boreal. So pretty much we can say we're the victims of outside regions uh, surveyed population results. So that type of dialogue, I, I look forward to sharing with the Satu and still being mindful that yes, let's take it seriously. There's good valued information that cost you a million dollars to do the survey last summer. I view it as being proactive even though there may not be a lot of substantial information to justify the decline in the Satu. And uh, I was just talking to my brother-in-law the other day and asked him if he had any caribou meat. And he uh, he has a trap line south of uh, south of Norman Well or south of Fort Good Hope on the way to Norman Wells. And he said we're we're running into uh, boreal caribou or woodland caribou. Everybody refers to that woodland. You can tell a difference. One's a lot, one's larger and darker. So maybe that you know that alone gives you the impression that the herd is populating. So now the herd, or portions of the herd, is going on the east side of the Mackenzie, not on the west side as identified by the map. So I, I, think, there's, I think they're going to have, you're going to have a, a good discussion at the Norman Wells meeting and hear from the trappers. One thing is to do the, do the studies on, on a screen here, electronic screen, but I, I, I value the input of, of the local people during the process. Thank you. Thank you. Take that as a comment. Anything to the comment? Dr. Dragon. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you know, and it's a, it's a good comment. I, I think we should have mentioned it at the beginning of when we use the terminology of boreal caribou versus barren ground caribou. And uh, as the member indicated, we all know they're woodland caribou. Uh, but when we look at it from a national perspective, Environment and Climate Change Canada uses boreal caribou. So I just have to be cognizant of uh, looking at boreal caribou versus barren ground caribou. Um, and we, we go through this conversation in, in terms of looking at the two different herds. Uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, it gets confusing. Um, and so what I've done uh, over the last uh, year and a half is we bolstered our communications group. Uh, brought people in that I think have been able to lend a really good lens at trying to plain language documents so that we get that information out. I, I hope you've been able to see some of that in terms of um, the stuff that we recently did in, in the population surveys is, is to try to plain language it so that when we are talking about the two species we don't get confused. Uh, and I, I just note that uh, it is one where you know we, we go back and forth um, so when we look at isolated populations of woodland caribou, a very separate type of approach versus barren ground caribou. Um, and we deploy callers on both of them. The, the $1 million that, that you had mentioned in, in, in terms of what we spent on, that is for barren, for barren ground caribou surveys. So we spent a million dollars on that. We typically do that every three years. For the, for the woodland or the boreal caribou, uh, we spent about half a million dollars last year in terms of that in three regions, uh, in the South Slave, the Decho, and the North Slave. So very specific, and, and so um, I, I just mentioned that because a lot of times they do get cross-referenced, and so uh, we have to do a better job at communicating it out. We're, again, looking at how do we provide that not only in... Um, in our uh, information that's online, but also getting it translated into uh, indigenous languages so that it can be put out there so people can get it. So we've really made, uh, and I've made a, an opportunity for our folks to start communicating it more so that we get the information out. And um, But we'll be looking for feedback as we, as we produce those materials and if you think they're valuable in those community meetings. But we'll have a set of those when we do the community meetings as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Lastly, <coughs> pardon me, Mr. McNeely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
My recommendation in, in preparation for these in, in Indigenous uh, consultations is to bring more information. It's good to have your, your, your bullet presentation here, but in detail, I think we need more. Like if, if, if you're, you're saying that the uh, herds are declining in, in Adecho and South Slave, why? And we all know that there's tags from um, <coughs> tags that are issued to the uh, big game hunters. How many? How many in the Satu? How many along the whole Mackenzie Mountain Range? So that type of information is incorporated in the presentation. So the more information you give, the the, the, the less answers you'll you'll get, and uh, I think it'll be valued by the. Uh, the indigenous uh, consultation processes. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I, I don't doubt the um, commitment of any of the individuals sitting at this table. And I've worked with some of you before I even became an MLA for many years. Um, I think what this could really comes down to is, is uh, political will and priorities uh, of our government and. Um, uh, I guess I want to start uh, with uh, in the Section 11 agreement um, that we're trying to negotiate with the federal government, there's uh, a part here, 10.3, Canada will contribute funds to support the participation of Indigenous partners uh, to achieve the agreement outcomes, which is a recovery strategy. Half of these funds will support GNWT to coordinate and facilitate Indigenous engagement. Uh, and half will provide support to Indigenous organizations. So can someone tell me what kind of funding is available for this uh, framework development and then the actual development of the, the plans themselves? Uh, uh, that's part of this arrangement. And GNWT has made some commitments to seek additional funding itself through the uh, uh, agreement with uh, the uh, uh, CMAs, sorry, the uh, um, Conservation Management Authorities, I think, or whatever they're called. Uh, so how much money is available for this process? Because the, the, there's nothing in the presentation about that or in any of the background documents that, that, that we have available to us. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Dr. Dragon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so in terms of looking at this uh, Section 11 agreement, um, you know, we haven't yet signed that agreement in terms of it being uh, fully available for public uh, um, recognition of how much money we've identified. But we've really gone through in an exhaustive approach, uh, multi-bilateral meetings with uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada. We're one of the first uh, at the gates in terms of getting money for this research. Um, the you know, once environment and climate change actually signs it, then we'll be able to disclose to the committee how much money it is. But I just want to give the committee reassurance that through those negotiations, I think that what we have in place will be enough money to be able to do this research. Um, but more importantly, I think we got enough money there to do a proper engagement and consultation process. And I think it's one area where we have to go back to environment and climate change a few times to be able to demonstrate them how we do co-management in the Northwest Territories. Um, I must say, like coming back to the North and seeing how we consult and engage with Indigenous groups and organization is a model for the rest of Canada. Um, but a lot of, uh, in Ottawa, they don't understand how we do it. Um, so I've been working very hard at trying to uh, demonstrate why we do these meetings, why it costs a lot of money to do these meetings when we're bringing community members in, uh, chartering planes in some instances where they have to come in to, so that they have a voice at the table. Um, but I, I can reassure the committee that uh, if the agreement is signed with the money that we have allocated, I, I'm confident we have enough money to be able to do this process effectively, efficiently, uh, but also as a co-management process that would be in the standards that we've done in the past in the Northwest Territories. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly? Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I, I'm happy to take the, the Deputy Minister at his word. Um, I think we may, as a committee, want to chat afterwards about this, but uh, 
You know, in the 2018-19 budget, uh, $150,000 was cut out of Boreal Caribou monitoring, and that's at a time when we're legally obligated to come up with a recovery strategy, when you folks are diligently working on trying to develop the planning framework. And look, I've looked at it. I think it's sound, um, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. But our monitoring obligations are also going to increase because of the Tlicho all season road. So um, I don't, as I said, question the motives of any of the individuals sitting at this table. This is an issue of political will and priorities. So while our government is uh, cutting funding for uh, Boreal Caribou monitoring and our responsibilities are increasing, um, it just doesn't, it's, doesn't wash. So. Um, I want to move on to the, the content of the, the draft. As I understand, this is a framework, and the individual plans are probably going to be another order of magnitude or more detailed as we're, as we're starting to see with a Bathurst uh, plan that we're going to discuss next. Um, but even the, uh, the framework document is a little bit weak on the implementation side. Exactly what instruments, who's going to be responsible for implementation, there's a little bit of information in there about timelines. You've talked about the working groups and how we're going to, the range plans are going to be done in the, in the southern areas first where the, the pressures are probably greater, and I think that's a, a sound approach. But um, uh, how are we going to implement this uh, 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 in a legally binding way that's going to make sure the caribou are protected? Because I think I heard... Um, one of the witnesses say that these plans are going to protect caribou and support economic development. These plans are not about promoting or supporting economic development. They're about saving caribou. So how can you provide me some reassurance that we're going to get the implementation right on these and that we have the, the, uh, the will to pursue this and, and get it done? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Dr. Dragon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think when we looked at the the opportunity to be involved in the Section 11 agreement, really what that allowed us to do is to do a made in the north approach um, versus having the feds come in and dictate us uh, what we needed to do with uh, boreal caribou habitat plans. Um, I think the framework, again, looking at it, uh, having the ability to see what are the pieces that we have to consider. But again, a big part of what we need to do is work with our co-management partners in each of those five regions to be able to come up with a scenario that works for each of those regions, respective of their land claims and self-government uh, agreements. Um, but also looking at some of the realities that we have here in the north. Um, and so, you know, looking at development and the opportunity, I think we have to consider development in the conversation. And in order to have sustainable populations, we have to recognize that development will possibly happen. And how do we look at whether or not we mitigate opportunities uh, or actually adapt to economic development in the territory? And uh, the sustainability of, uh, you know, I think not only our economy, but also our caribou populations, they're both imperative as we go forward. Um, so as a department, we look at both. We have to put both on the table as we're going through. But I also point to we have natural factors as well, and that's fire. And we need to look at the opportunity of as we go in. Uh, this is really an agreement that looks at uh, available habitat for boreal caribou. So it's looking at old growth forests. It's looking at key areas that we have within the territory that are suitable habitat. Uh, we look at areas that are contiguous, so areas that have the ability for caribou to move from one area to the next. Um, and those are key areas that we're looking at. And from a natural disturbance side, one of the things that we're looking at doing in the department is actually identifying those areas as kind of values at risk in our fire management strategy. Um, and I think that's an important change that we're going to be doing as we look at these frameworks. And it's really highlighted them. Uh, of us to be looking at all aspects. So um, again, I think as we look at uh, a framework, we, we put everything on the table as what could possibly be affecting this conversation. 
and as we look at that, we, uh, we continue to say, okay, how can we do this with our co-management partners in developing a plan that works uh, in each of the respective regions? And, um, and so that's why we looked at kind of where we start in the southern part and then move up, uh, is we do believe that's where we have to identify it uh, at the beginning. Um, but these all take time uh, in terms of our conversations with our partners, um, and it's going to take a, a lot of time. Uh, but again, I feel confident that the money that we're going to be receiving for these is going to give us the ability to do a really good job in that consultation and engagement and then really flesh out the details of an implementation plan once we have the concurrence of our co-management partners. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Just to remind folks that we have another presentation and we also have a public presentation um, coming into this room at 10.30, so let's try to be mindful of the time. Further, Mr. O'Reilly. Nothing further. Next, I have Mr. Thompson. Thank you. Um, again, I apologize. I'm not part of this committee, so I'm kind of a little outside. But um, my understanding is Nunavut has done a, an assessment of the population, and their numbers seem to have gone up um, from the 2008. Now, I guess my concern is, is how, how can that be a huge difference? How can that, we see an increase of 20,000, you know, caribou there in Nunavut, and it's the same hurt, if I'm not mistaken. So how can we have such a huge difference in uh, numbers? We're seeing a huge decline in our part, and they're seeing an increase in their part. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I'm not sure that it's the same herd. Oh, okay. um, Dr. Dragon. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you are correct. It's a uh, different herd. So uh, that's dealing with barren ground caribou. And again, it, I think it really speaks to when we're talking about these two species. It is confusing. Um, and, and our approach in terms of going back to communicating it out, um, uh, you know, a lot of this information is happening in the department at the same time. Um, and I do appreciate that it is con confusing uh, of going through. So we have to really, uh, again, why we've taken the approach of communicating it out different, uh, always looking for suggestions in terms of trying to do that. But we'll get to that in the second part of the presentation. Thank you. Further, Mr. Thompson? Uh, thank you. Mm, I apologize for asking that question. But um, so in the SAW 2, I've seen it in the press and that, that you know, they're saying the numbers are different as well. So how are we actually getting our numbers um, calculated? I mean, it just, is it because we haven't done the SOT 2, so that's why we didn't focus on that? Is that why we're not seeing their numbers or they're seeing the increases? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Dr. Dragon? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think, again, we're talking about different herds in terms of the census techniques that we're using. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the boreal caribou are in very distinct areas within the boreal forest. Um, so the techniques of, of identifying them within those real uh, individual areas uh, are a little different than what we do for barren ground caribou. But again, we look at deploying the use of collars to find out where we have animals within specific herds. Once we identify those, then we go over and do flights where we actually count them. And, and based on counting, I think it's important for, for the committee to, to, uh, to uh, realize that as we go through and we do census of any large animal that's on a really vast terrain, we can't count every single animal. Really what you're looking at, you're trying to provide an estimate of how many animals there are there, and you look at trends. So you look at trends of how many animals that you had versus the last time that you did. Um, so we can go over that in a little bit more detail on the barren ground because that's a little, a little different in terms of kind of how we go through. But the methodology is still the same, is that we still look for uh, using our callers, having an idea where these populations are. Based on that, going over uh, with an airplane and on the land to be able to count um, and to see whether or not we see any defined trends. And we look at a lot of things from... Uh, you know, whether or not we see cows and calves to see how many animals we're having coming back into the population. Uh, you know, we also look at composition where we say, here's how many cows, how many bulls, how many calves. Uh, and that gives you an indication of how healthy the herd is. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Thompson? Yeah, 
Thank you, and thank you, um, Dr. Dragon. I guess my next question then is, how do we tap into additional knowledge? Because I know when we did the Moose survey, we you, you informed us exactly how we tapped into traditional knowledge. So how is that um, tapped into? Because we're looking at broad um, jurisdiction of where the caribou move. So how is that being tapped into? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Dragon. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, traditional knowledge, I think we have, uh, we had the opportunity over the last couple of years to do a couple of really interesting projects that look at on the land uh, observational science of caribou uh, specifically. Uh, I point to two projects that are, we're doing right now that I think uh, I've seen some really great results. Uh, and that's one that's done in the Cleat Show and that's called Boots on the Ground where they go for, uh, they have about eight to ten members that go for about six to eight weeks on the land during the summer uh, where the summer range of, of the caribou and actually go and observe the caribou and see what they're doing and then document that. That's one that we do in the Clicho. The other one that we do is in Lutzoke uh, that we're partners on and help fund is in the Lutzoke uh, region with uh, LKDFN and that's called moccasins on the ground. The same idea of going out on the land and being able to have observational science. So one of the things that we're looking at doing in the department is really creating this opportunity to have more discussion of how to integrate traditional knowledge into the department. Um, and this is why I just recently formed an on the land unit that's very much specifically looking at all of these areas that we do in traditional economy, sustainable livelihoods, country foods, um, relates to our trapping programs, uh, a lot of the stuff that we're doing on the land, but a big component of it is going to be our traditional knowledge because this is a real gray area within the science community. And, and having gone through and, and studied applied science, I understand why. And, and the reason is is because in the applied science, in, in when you're talking about uh, in academia, uh, traditional knowledge is not into the methodology of how you do science in in, I would say not only in the north but all across Canada. So one of the things that I've been doing is meeting with the heads of NSERC and SHRC and those are the two granting councils in Ottawa that provide funding for applied science, that's NSERC, and for social science, that's uh, SHRC. And we just had the president up about two weeks ago uh, here talking about how do we blend the two. Uh, and then what are we going to do for ongoing traditional knowledge as uh, an integral part of how we do research in the north? And I think it's imperative on us on how we actually do that. But we have to start someplace. So um, I, I think that's, that's what we're looking at as a department of how do we incorporate it. It's not an exact science, but I think we need to try different things. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Nakamayak. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to thank my colleague for the, uh, the, his comments and questions and the presentation as well, too. Getting back to uh, um, traditional knowledge and local indigenous knowledge uh, and looking at these plans uh, and looking at the past, the last six, seven years of fires we've had in the territory, um, it's going to affect the, the, the woodland caribou more than any other herds as, as fires would drive them out. And I'm wondering if those would be indicators um, uh, Mr. Dragon mentioned um, where, do you, where do you fit traditional knowledge into this. I think if you look at this map and you look at the different colors of Gwich'in and Nivelle, the Yukon, the Sawtu, the Wakiji, and the Southern NWT, they're all indigenous groups in these regions. And I think when you develop, when you ask the question of where do you fit traditional knowledge into science, I think you need to start at the beginning. You need to plan with indigenous peoples, plan with, uh, with, with the, the co-management groups uh, all along the, the, the valley and I think that's an important way to, place to start before we move anywhere else into, into, into this. Otherwise we'll have two systems that are, that are working and not necessarily working together and sometimes even clashing. So and that's where you get the clashing between science and traditional and local knowledge. So I think we need to really start from the beginning. Um, if it means starting over then there's an opportunity to do that as well too. It's never too late to start but it's good to start right. I just want to know what the, the minister, uh, deputy minister have to say about that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Take that as a comment. To the comment, Dr. Dragon. Uh, exactly. So looking at having it 
starting in all the work that we're doing. It has to become an int integral part of the department. Um, we're moving towards that end. I don't think it's starting f over. I think we've we started. We're actually in both those projects that I mentioned earlier. We're in year. Uh, it'll be year three coming up. Um, so there's lessons learned. Uh, we also do a lot on community water-based monitoring where we've had a lot of lessons learned and we have to keep on adding to those lessons learned. Um, but I also see and through these regions as an opportunity when we talk about guardians programs as the opportunity again, how do we incorporate traditional knowledge? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Anything further, Mr. Nakamayak? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for that. I appreciate the answer. Uh, uh, and the explanation. Uh, some of the some of my colleagues um, have, have asked questions that I wanted to like. And where does this? Another question is where does this move into once you get the framework out from the regional planning to the final? And, and you know, I'm just wondering what types of enforcement that that the GNWT is looking at, and what types of uh, how does it work with co-management in, in all of the regions? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Dragon. Yes, uh, in, in terms of our, our role with the co-management uh, bodies, I'll start with that, is that I think it's imperative, again, that we have that conversation so we develop our Made in the North approach based on each region and looking at what's kind of going on in each region. Each of them are different. Um, and in different areas, we have different fire behaviors that are going on. We know some regions are getting a lot drier. Uh, we expect them to be able... Uh, you know, if, if we look in the future, some areas having uh, more fire activity. We had a real blip last year in terms of not very much activity. I think in total we had 56 fires last year, which is a complete anomaly. Normally we're in around the 217 per year, so it's an anomaly. But as we look at the areas, the one thing that we have to do is identify these patch and networks for boreal ca caribou habitat identify those and then come up with uh, a values at risk scenario where we look at um, the first thing is uh, human uh, anything having to do with communities or infrastructure and and then looking from from there we look at cabins and and the ability to protect some of those and then we look at um, you know when we're looking at caribou habitat that all has to go in the equation along with how many fire crews that we have going out and, and, and the type of year that we have. I think we can all agree 2014 was a, a pretty uh, extensive fire burn year and, and that just based on you know, we had so many fires that it was very tough to figure out where we're going to fight. And, and we have crews that are, you know, our fire crews are four person crews with a crew leader, right? And so when you look at deploying those across, uh, the Northwest Territories. It really depends on how fire behavior is, is, is going through. So I would just lead it at that is that we, uh, as we go through individually, we look at the specific regions with our co-management partners to come up with a plan and we do it together versus having the feds come in and tell us how we're going to do it. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. One more, Mr. Nakamayak. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for that, Mr. Dragon. Uh, I, I look at uh, in my region, we have a reindeer herd, and uh, and working with the Sami in Finland, Norway, um, Sweden, and Russia, um, there's so much development in some parts of that Arctic with mining um, that that some of the reindeer herders have to put their their reindeer in the back of a semi truck like they do pigs and bring them to their spring um, their spring grazing areas, and, and, and you know that's where they they calve as well too. I'm just wondering. We're, we're making plans now for how many years down the road. We're looking 40 or 50 years down the road. We might have to start herding um, some of these animals. And I'm just wondering if that question's ever been put out to the indigenous people across the territory because uh, in one way or another, there's caribou fences that, that, that lead some of the caribou herds in my region to, to areas where they now um, have their migration routes. And, I, um, and those take, they don't take a couple of years to build. They take a few generations to do that. And we definitely see the... They're called caribou fences in, in some areas. Definitely, like where my family has our lodge, the, a caribou, uh, it's 96 kilometers long, and it ends right by our lodge, right by the migration route. And funny enough, we discovered that only afterwards. We've seen some of these corrals and some of the harpoons that they've used through the years. And, you know, we might be going back to days where we're actually corralling um, caribou and, and, and helping them that way because the amount of um, mining that might be going on between um, Northwest Territories and Nunavut those areas might be really, really sensitive and, and take um, action maybe sooner than later, and, and extreme action. I don't know what it might take, but I think um, 
if we're affecting them this way, we're going to have to step in, and it's going to cost a lot of money down the road. So we have to, I think we have to make a long-range plan to think that might be uh, us one day. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Take that as a comment. To the comment, Dr. Dragon. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think we can look at what our uh, colleagues in other jurisdictions are really doing right now for boreal caribou to see what could be the effect if we don't properly manage our caribou here. So in the jurisdictions of Alberta and Saskatchewan right now, they're penning woodland caribou, boreal caribou, that are in areas where they've lost habitat. The populations have dwindled uh, to the point of, uh, you know, the risk of ex extinction. Uh, in those areas. So they're spending a lot of money on doing maternal penning and trying to boost up the herds in those areas. Um, you know, I think one of the things that we've been able to look at from, from this work and looking at the range planning is we have a lot of great habitat in the Northwest Territories. We just have to make sure that we, we protect areas with, that are critical for boreal caribou. And then uh, as we look at the different influencing factors from whether it be development or forest fires, uh, man-made or human-caused, we have to make sure that that's all put in the mix and that we have a plan like this that will take us forward and be able to address some of those issues, again, with our co-management partners, I think, is, is key. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Alkin, for the next presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in your package, you'll have a uh, presentation entitled The Bathurst Caribou Range Plan. Uh, this will, uh, through this presentation, I'd like to provide you with an update on a collaborative process to develop a Bathurst Caribou Range Plan. This plan is intended to manage the cumulative effects across the range of the Bathurst Caribou herd to help support conservation and recovery of this herd. Slide two provides you an overview of what we'll cover in this presentation. Uh, we will cover the reasons a range plan, Bathurst Caribou range plan is being developed, the process and approach used to develop the plan, the plan's overall goals, objectives, and recommendations, a description of the cumulative land disturbance framework that will be a cornerstone of the plan, an assessment of the current status of the herd's range using this system, examples of management actions that will be used when there are different levels of disturbance on the range, and engagement and consultation, ending with next steps. Slide number three covers the reasons that we are developing a Bathurst Caribou Range Plan. As you are all aware, the Bathurst Caribou Herd has undergone a significant decline and a new population estimate released on November 20th, 2018 confirmed that this decline has continued. The 2018 estimate is 8,210, a drop of nearly 60% since 2015 when the herd was about 20,000 animals. The GWT and its co-management partners are very concerned about the status of this herd and are committed to take management actions to support its recovery. There is an expectation expectation from Indigenous governments and organizations and our other co-management partners that we take actions to support herd recovery beyond just restricting harvest. Harvest of the Bathurst herd is currently set at zero. Barren ground caribou have been assessed as threatened federally and were listed as threatened in the NWT in July 2018. The territorial recovery strategy is now being developed by the NWT Conference of Management Authorities and needs to be completed by July 2020. If barren ground caribou are listed nationally, a federal recovery strategy will also be required, which will include uh, identification of critical habitat. The Bathurst Caribou Range Plan could form a substantial part of both recovery plans. The idea of a, of a Bathurst Caribou Range Plan initially came out of environmental assessment process for both the Gacho Quay and the J Project projects. One of the environmental assessment measures issued by the Mackenzie Valley Environmental Impact Review Board directed the NWT to take a leadership role in developing an approach to manage cumulative effects on the range of the Bathurst caribou herd. Slide 4 outlines the process and approach we are taking. A multi-stakeholder Bathurst caribou range plan working group was formed to help guide the development of this plan. The working group included representatives from 21 organizations from across the herd's range in the NWT, Nunavut, and Northern Saskatchewan. 
This included members from Indigenous governments and organizations, federal and territorial departments, environmental organizations, and industry. On this working group, the GNWT was represented by the departments of ENR, Lands, and ITI. The working group started their work in 2014, and since that time held 13 meetings and four workshops. The process has brought together the best available science and traditional knowledge to understand the current state and pressures on the herd and its range and recommend approaches to manage cumulative effects. Slide six outlines the goals and objectives of the plan. The overall goal of the, of the draft Bathurst Caribou Range Plan is to ensure people and all activities are managed to maintain the Bathurst Caribou Herd Range in a healthy state. The working group identified four main objectives to support this goal. Make sure the most important parts of the range, such as calving grounds, key water crossings, and land movement corridors are not disturbed. Make sure the herd can move freely throughout the range. Develop thresholds for how much humans can disturb the range and manage road developments and traffic within the herd, range of the herd. To help achieve these objectives, the Bath draft Bathurst Caribou Range Plan includes a series of recommendations and a cumulative land disturbance framework, which I will touch on in the next two slides. On slide six outlines the recommendations that are currently listed in the draft plan. These recommendations address various impacts of cumulative effects on caribou and their habitat, while trying to be flexible and adaptable for industry. I will walk through them one by one. Uh, the first one is to establish a cumulative land disturbance framework and manage according to defined disturbance categories. The second is to support indigenous community garden guardianship programs to foster traditional practices and to monitor, indust monitor industrial development, caribou numbers and health, and where the caribou were found across their range. The third recommendation is to consider the level of protection around important water crossings and land bridges. And the fourth is to consider the level of protection for calving and post-calving areas. The sixth recommendation is to use a mobile caribou conservation measures in the area of core caribou use. As an example, this could involve shutting down some project activities when caribou are nearby in order to reduce disturbance to caribou. The sixth recommendation is when developing new roads in the Bathurst Caribou Range, consider best practices for road construction, routing, and traffic management to reduce impacts on caribou. The seventh is to use offsetting where, where appropriate to make up for impacts to caribou that remain after all actions are taken to avoid and minimize impacts. The eighth is to identify important patches of mature forest in the winter range that can be considered under ENR's values at risk approach to fire management. And the final ninth recommendation in the draft plan is to consider online staking to reduce sensory disturbance to caribou associated by physical on the land staking. Slide seven uh, gives an overview of the cumulative land disturbance framework. This framework, the proposed framework, forms a major component of the draft caribou range plan. The framework proposes three categories of range disturbance. Healthy, where you have low levels of disturbance. Cautionary, which is a moderate level of disturbance, or high risk areas. A number of management actions are identified that then could be applied across the range. The specific management actions that are used would be increased as you move from the healthy to the cautionary range disturbance categories. For example, best practices would, pra best practices would be used in healthy areas, while higher standards would be expected in cautionary areas. The intent of this framework is to keep disturbance levels out of the high risk category. Slide eight shows uh, the current status of the Bathurst herd evaluated through this framework. The map shows the traditional range of the Bathurst caribou herd using the cumulative land disturbance framework. It also shows all development on the Bathurst range, including communities, roads, mines, and exploration camps. The pink color shows the areas around these features where caribou are thought to be disturbed. Information on current habitat disturbance was assessed and assigned to one of three categories, healthy, cautionary, or high risk. In the current assessment, you can see from the map that 64% of the herd ranges are currently in the proposed healthy category, while 36 fall within the cautionary range. At this time, there were no areas that were identified in the high risk category. During engagement on the draft range plan, significant feedback was received on the cumulative land disturbance framework. 
As expected, some people believe that the serpent thresholds are too high, i.e. the entire range should be declared in the red. <laughs> Others believe that they are too low, the entire range should be declared in the green. Slide 9 shows um, examples of management actions by disturbance level to give an idea of how this plan would work. The cumulative land disturbance framework describes management actions that would be undertaken in each of the range status categories. As the amount of cumulative disturbance increases, the number of management actions to manage cumulative effects will be increased. This approach is consistent with what is used in other jurisdictions and with the framework being developed to guide boreal caribou range planning in the Northwest Territories. Slide 9 outlines the formal engagement and consultation process used for this process. ENR has conducted two rounds of formal engagement and consultation to date. We did an initial engagement on the Bathurst Caribou Range Plan discussion document from January to April 2017. A second consultation period was held on the draft Bathurst Caribou Range Plan itself from January to April 2018. During this round, in-person presentations were conducted in all communities on the Bathurst Herd Range, and ENR also received 19 formal written submissions with comments. Based on everything that was we heard during these consultations, the working group has revised the draft Bathurst Caribou Range Plan. The changes are relatively minor compared to the last draft, and the major goals and objectives and approaches are remain the same in the current draft. Slide 11 shows the next steps as we continue to move forward with this process. In accordance with the Clicho Agreement, the Minister of ENR must now submit the proposed Bathurst Caribou Range Plan to the Wakiji Renewable Resources Board for review as per Section 12.5 of the Clicho Agreement. Once that is complete, we will work to com finalize and begin implementing the Bathurst Caribou Range Plan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Elkin. Dr. Dragon, did you have something to add? Yes, if I could just add, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So with the new population estimate for the Bathurst Caribou, this has raised, obviously, significant concern. And I guess highlighting the need for all, uh, us, work, us to work together to support the recovery of the herd. I think this work that we've been doing for the last four years in terms of the consultation and engagement has put us in a really good position to look at one aspect of that, and that this is habitat and, and what we're doing together to, uh, a, as uh, co-management partners, uh, and how do we manage habitat. So I think we're in a really good spot after four years of extensive, extensive conversations. Uh, Dr. Alkin mentioned 21 uh, different organizations that we've had conversations over the last four years. Um, but again, we have to make a made in the north approach to these and, and that's really what we're looking at doing. Um, and especially uh, when we're looking at this herd in, in particular, uh, as well as the Blue Nose East, uh, I think the Minister has offered to do uh, a technical briefing with the committee uh, if time would allow, and I, I think that's been in the queue. I'm not sure whether or not that's been scheduled or not, but we'd be happy to do that as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Dr. Dragon? Comments, questions, concerns from committee? First I have Mr. Nakamayak. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for the presentation. I'm looking on page eight here, and you know, we're uh, we're in the we're the we're in the highest population part of the territory, the most dense. Where there's there's mining, there uh, we're at the capital. There's a few communities outlined as well. You know, in in the uh, Clicho. I'm just wondering if you, the departments um, ever looked at using drones um, to monitor. Not to monitor just the caribou, but to look at, look at the other wildlife impacts like the wolves, uh, bears, and, and other and other factors rather than just a human factor and development factor, and, and how it may affect and how we could possibly improve research and help um, um, help the recovery plan for this for for this herd in particular. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Dragon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll do some introductory comments to it and then ask Dr. Elkin to talk about the specific uh, species that we look at. I just want to mention in terms of looking at drones and, and what other jurisdictions have used for uh, the visualization of what species are doing, uh, I don't think the jury's still out on whether or not drones really are a positive thing in terms of looking at populations. I know when different jurisdictions do them on deer populations, they make them run 
Uh, you know, you have uh, the opportunity. The animals actually see the drones or, and will turn up and look at drones. They hear them. Um, and I know the technology is changing, but we continue to look at them. We primarily use drones if we have them in and around communities, and we would have uh, like a grizzly bear in a community or something like that. Uh, but in terms of uh, respect to species, I'll turn it over to Dr. Elkin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Dr. Elkin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think drones, and, and taking a step back and looking broader, we definitely were a technology and high-tech group that is looking for, as you know, any ways to improve our ability to do our research. So we certainly, as Joe alludes to, the DM alludes to, we are looking at drones. Certainly we're working, we have a group of the Department of the Government looking at technology, see where it will fit. One of the challenges in addition to what was highlighted about disturbance is there may be short-term value for them in some species where you work locally. Some of the, there'll be some technical challenges when you're doing working hundreds or thousands of kilometers away. We're also what we are also pursuing. Just to add on to the question, is a lot of things like satellite imagery, so a lot of high-tech stuff. Because I think it's anything that helps us move our job, covering the ground, covering the land and the wildlife on the ground is pretty difficult. So we certainly are exploring. As soon as it becomes available and we can use it safely and legally, we would definitely be using these tools. Thank you. Thank you. Further, Mr. McAmey. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, getting back to uh, to that, you know, we sometimes we focus on one species. We need to look at the whole the ecosystem as a whole and, and how it affects um, different regions of the territory, uh, different terrain, um, their migration routes. I, I'm sure some, I can look at the caribou. They they change their migration routes when the vegetation is poor. They might move to another one. And that may be favorable for wolves, for grizzly bears, where there's more cover and they, they, they can be, um, the predation um, rate is a little bit higher. Um, look at things like that, and it, it might help us um, look at the cycle. They, some people say it's a 30-year cycle, but who knows what it really is um, in actuality, right? It looks, it, I, I think, you know, from the people that I speak to, which are a lot of elders and a lot of hunters who spend time, um, all their time on the land harvesting and hunting and, and, and understanding the, the, the uh, um, understanding animals more closely and, and, their, and, and how they react to human, to activity, to, to hunting, to trapping. Where there's, where there's activity, it attracts all types of animals. So I think we need to look at that more and, and uh, to understand um, you know, what's really pushing these care. When we look at the government, we look at um, the mining industry as well too, the J-pipe. Um, we kind of um, put um, conservation second to development and it's, I think we need to balance that a little bit better um, and be more stringent with times of you know of migration of um, you know uh, during calving times as well too those are the most probably the most sensitive times for animals uh, you know if you if you lose one you actually lose two so we need to um, the springtime might be a, a time where um, there's no no flying no activity in my region, um, with the Blue Nose East, the Blue Nose West around Paltek, and Tuktuk Nugget National Park, we definitely have a no-fly time. And that really helps with, with, um, with, with, I wouldn't say management, but with recovery of some of the species and so that they stay on those migration routes. We're not driving them away. Uh, we need to factor all of those in how we think about, you know, industry and, and, and our plans. I think um, it may not just be ENR. It may be um, cross departments, other departments that work together to ensure that they're actually working together. And we're not duplicating what we're uh, what what uh, the government's doing, or what one, one the Invalid Game Council or other management um, regimes are, are doing. So I think it, um, the, 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 you say that you're spending a lot of money on, on getting people together. We might have to make those dollars more effective by bringing more and more people, to, more experts to the table, um, not just science, and include indigenous and traditional knowledge um, within Saskatchewan, Nunavut, Northwest Territories. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Let's take that as a comment. To the comment, Dr. Dragon. Uh, yes, thank, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, and I think it's really, again, imperative on us to make sure that we're working with our co-management partners in the regions. We have a, many boards that kind of have different, we have nine, nine different herds within the Northwest Territories and calving grounds sometimes that go into other jurisdictions like Nunavut. So. Uh, we've kept a very good relationship with Nunavut of how we're doing uh, management back from calving grounds that take them to summer grounds that take them to fall 
wintering grounds. Um, but it's this ongoing dialogue, and uh, the minister's uh, going to have some. We're going to have some meetings in January with our Nunavut colleagues to talk about how we continue to to look at the uh, the summer range, uh, because a lot of that for the Bathurst herd is it's the calving grounds are in Nunavut and the summer grounds are in Nunavut and then into the Northwest Territories as it comes. So. Um, very much take that as uh, you know as we go forward making sure that we're talking with our interjurisdictional partners thank you mr. chair thank you In the interest of time I'm gonna have to keep moving on next I have mr. O'Reilly uh, thanks mr. Chair. yeah um, I'm not very happy that we're down to 15 minutes to talk about a caribou crisis quite frankly I know the range plan is meant to try to help address it but um, in any event we need more time to talk about this. Um, there's two statements in the, 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 the draft plan that I find really quite troubling. It says, this document does not represent government policy direction. And secondly, range, the range plan is advisory and all recommendations are non-binding. So with those two statements, how can we have any confidence that our government is actually behind this and is going to implement any aspect of it. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Dr. Dragon. Thanks, Mr. Chair. As, as we go through and we look at the plan, I'll, I'll turn to, to Dr. Elkin to talk about the non-binding aspect, but as we look at this plan and how it evolves with our co-management partners, again, having uh, the opportunity to look at what are, what are the actions and, and how do we implement this going forward, again, we have to do that with our co-management partners and be respective of their respective land claims and self-government agreements that they've uh, respectively signed and, and in terms of how they see managing the resource in their respective regions. But again, uh, looking at this draft plan, the opportunity for us is to put uh, a lot of four years of conversations of, of all those discussions into a plan that then takes us forward. Uh, for the next 10 years and so I think us having the ability to to lay the groundwork the framework of where we're going to go um, I would see this as uh, as we learn and as we find things that are working we would add to this plan this is not going to be a static plan this is as we learn to be able to work with our partners to keep on identifying areas where we can make it a better plan I'll turn it over to Dr. Elkin for the non-binding conversation thanks thank you Dr. Elkin Thank you, Mr. Chair. Going through this process and identifying where measures could be taken to help aid the herd, it became really clear through this, and hence the large size of the group, is the authority lays within three jurisdictions, many different departments and agencies, different groups that what this plan hoped to do was come up and say from a caribou perspective to make sure we're coordinated across this range and across different jurisdictions and across different management authorities, we have the best advice and come together as a collective and say in this plan, this is what needs to be done. The challenge now is what needs to be done going forward is when we actually finalize the plan and it comes out of the hands of the working group and the technical folks is each of those groups needs to take a serious look at this plan and say how are we going to use it. No single group has control for all of the recommendations or the areas, or even many of them. They're very well shared. So we, I think that is the next step. The GNWT needs to look at what we're going to do within our things in our control, and that involves many departments, but we also have to be talking to Nunavut and Saskatchewan and uh, all our partners of what, what falls in their backyard and what are they going to look at implementing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly? Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I, I understand it's shared responsibility. Um, my concern is that by the time we actually get a joint management proposal together, submitted to the Wekaji Renewable Resources Board, and other folks do that, there may not be a herd left. So uh, what? how much time is it going to take? Like it's taken from, and I was part of this process at the beginning, you guys know that, and I think it's a sound plan. The problem is how do we actually translate it into specific action, but how, how much longer is it going to take to uh, develop the joint management proposal that has to be submitted to the Wekaji Renewable Resources Board to finally get some action on the ground? And the herd is in a crisis situation, and we've, there's nothing else we can do on the harvest side. So how much longer is it going to take to get the joint management proposal together? Thank you. Dr. Alkin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, for the 
Given experience in 2015, we've approached the Wakiji board already to plan ahead because given the state of the Bathurst herd, we want something, we want some actions changed, whatever can be, can be done this winter. But some, because of the co-management process, some major changes will need to go through that full system. We would like them in place before the next harvest season, before next fall. So working backwards in the time, in time, the recommendations we've got is that we need to submit a joint management proposal in January, probably in early January. This plan will be, we, we know the contents of it, but it will not be finalized by that point. But we will, we need to work with the Cleach government. It will be a joint proposal. But one of the things we will consider is what components of this or, or what, how do we phrase this. But it, some aspects of this will be included in that plan that will be submitted in January. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly. Yeah, thanks. i just got two more quick ones. Well, one, um, yeah, uh, this is a crisis. Um, one of the things that we have to seriously talk about is habit, or sorry, predator control. Now is the time where wolves can and should be taken if we want to save the herd. Um, and um, that needs to be part of the management proposal. Um, there's, I don't understand why mobile <coughs> caribou conservation uh, uh, measures couldn't have been implemented years ago. That's something that, that people have been asking for for years. It hasn't been done. Um, and. Nothing's been done on the habitat side. The Tlicho government has taken a lead. They've got a land use plan for their own lands, but we've done nothing on the on the uh, as, even after de devolution, while we wait for the plan. So, um, those are some. Are those going to be part of the joint uh, management uh, proposal? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Dragon. Thank you. Um, so in terms of looking at the overall plan for the herd, uh, again, we could look at doing a technical presentation that talks about the facets of that. Predator control is one in which we're looking at uh, implementing something that would be done this year, but also looking at how we go forward, as well as looking with uh, our colleagues in Nunavut of how we look at the range, <coughs> that the calving grounds, the summer range, and the winter range. Um, and so we're definitely looking at that and, and we'll have some options going forward. Um, in, in looking at the habitat, again, this is one piece of the puzzle. Uh, with the dwindling herds that we've had, uh, we've had a, a, a lot smaller herd that actually now uses less habitat. And right now what we're seeing is even the herds not even coming into the, the boreal forest and staying near the tree line uh, because they're dwindling at numbers. Um, you know, and I, again, I'd like to provide the committee with more information on this. Uh, we have some information that we can leave with you guys on both the Boreal and the Bathurst. Uh, but a technical briefing where we go through all the options that we're looking at, I think would be very valuable for the committee. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anything further, Mr. O'Reilly? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I would very much like to have that technical briefing. I've got a whole series of questions around what Nunavut is during, doing in terms of its surveys, the, the wolf management feasibility study, what's happening on the Nunavut side in terms of harvesting their land use plan. You have an offsetting policy study that you've done. Um, Dominion Diamond is supposed to be funding half a million dollars of car caribou research related to the Bathurst. I've got a whole bunch of very detailed technical questions we can't get to today. Um, but this is a crisis situation and our government needs to be taking action not we can't wait any longer this thanks mr chair thank you take that as a comment next i have mr mcneely thank you mr chair mine's more of a comment here i'm i'm glad that um i'm glad that uh that this is being taken seriously same as my colleague here from frame lake had mentioned and um and I, I would like to see or recommend we we have more information on on the on the predator side of the herd. What is causing the decline? Uh, we can come up with numerous um, suggestions here. The uh, the population of wolves, uh, barren land, uh, um, grizzly bears uh, killing off the babies or the calves, and and so on. So. <coughs> So I, I recommend moving forward there, sharing that information with the uh, with the working group, as, as well as us here as well, and then just you know the the whole validity of the numbers themselves. If you look at your your last survey number, 
2018, it's 8,200 animals. And even if you double that and said 16, and comparable in, in percentage here to the 2003 numbers, you're still 90% lower. So if, if, if you think about that context, you can say, really, I, the, the numbers really say we got to take this seriously, as my colleague mentioned. So, thank you. Thank you. Comment noted to the comment, Dr. Dragon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is a very, very serious decline in the population, and I think what we've tried to do is come out with information that we're informing uh, the public uh, in terms of uh, the information that we have to, uh, as we look at caribou populations, this is what I studied for my doctorate, it was caribou population dynamics, is very much one of where we see caribou populations rise really quickly and actually fall very quickly. Uh, we know they go through these these pockets of 20 to 40 years where we have a, a really high population and then it'll go down from 20 to 40 years in low population. And I think right now uh, we are taking this very, very seriously. We've been doing lots of engagement with our partners. Uh, we don't see it as something that we can do on our own. We have to do it with our partners and looking at all facets whether or not they're predators, whether it's looking at this uh, this range plan. And I think, as I mentioned, I think this sets us up for a very good conversation on the range plan, but it's only one aspect of what we need to look at. Um, and, and providing, uh, again, I think what we need to do right now is really help the caribou through this low period because typically, and we've seen in other populations of caribou, this same cycle occur. Traditional knowledge tells us that we had these periods within the early 1900s, the mid, like around 1950, 1960. Uh, we actually had one study that was done by a researcher at University of Alberta and one of our researchers that tracked uh, the scarring on black spruce roots. So looking at the scarring as you're going through main areas and corridors, and you're able to use that root scarring, and they did this study in Quebec that uh, came up with the same, um, the same uh, evidence of showing when you've had higher populations and lower. So it's very similar to if you cut uh, a tree and you can count rings on a tree, you can do that on root scars, and they were able to show when the, the population has been low and when it's been high. But caribou population di dynamics are very implicit in that they they rise really fast. You'll go and, uh, you know, a caribou population without predators and good food will double its size every two years. Now, we have predators in these herds, and, and we have situations where right now we know that the trend is, you know, they're not going to other herds. The, the population is declining, and, and we've seen this, the George River herd and the Leaf herd in Quebec, they're in exactly the same scenario we're in right now. Uh, but what are we doing to kind of help them through this period? And, and so that's what we're focusing on right now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Dragon. And I want to take this opportunity to thank you and your uh, staff for being here today. Uh, this is clearly an important uh, conversation, one that has to and will continue. Um, and it won't just continue from the technical aspect. Uh, there's clearly some political aspects of this conversation that need to be had. And so uh, we will... Uh, uh, be taking you up at a time that's convenient with regard to the offer for further technical briefing uh, with more detail and uh, we have also uh, uh, offers from the minister uh, for further briefings as well and we'll certainly be taking the minister up at some point in time um, so with that uh, again thank you for coming and presenting today publicly that's very important and uh, we look forward to working with you in the future we can be adjourned thank you Thank you.